we are going to talk about the latest antiretrovirals approved. I have uh, no conflicts to declare. Um, this is just a reminder that although we will be using um, brand names, that does not mean that we are affiliated with pharmaceutical companies. This is just uh, mentioned for educational purposes. And this is just a disclosure of unconscious bias. So in case you identify in our um, slides or in our content, if you see anything that could potentially um, include any unconscious bias, please let us know so that we update our content. The learning objectives today are to increase our knowledge of uh, antiretrovirals, describe the antiretrovirals approved in the latest five years, and then discuss two drug therapy options. So this is a list of antiretrovirals approved since 2018. Uh, this is funny when I, I graduated in 2018, I've been practicing for the last five years, and um, this just feels like a lifetime. At the same time, it, it's great to have uh, all these great new tools. It's important to recognize that there's a lot of effort that has been put into approval of all these agents and studies to approve these agents have been ongoing for several more years. So it's great to have more tools in our toolbox, um, but recognize that this is a, the result of several years of hard work. We'll talk about each one of this. First of all is Bictegravir. Uh, this is an integrated strand transfer inhibitor. All of you guys are probably very familiar with uh, Bictegravir. It comes as a single pill a day, co-formulated with emtricitabine and tenofovir alafenamide, and it's uh, probably the, the tool we use more frequently for a rapid initiation of antiretrovirals or rapid start. It does have some um, drug interactions, but are very rare uh, because it's processed through the CYP3A and UGT1A1 substrates. Uh, it's minimal drug interactions, but keep in mind, we're going to be talking about some of these in the case today uh, where there's uh, some drug interactions with strong inducers like rifampin. Um, so it inhibits these transporters in the kidney, so OCT2 and MAT. Mat, mat um, so because of this, so these transporters are in charge of excreting the fatty line in the kidney. And uh, if they're inhibited, then you will get toxic levels of the fatty light in the bloodstream. So because of this, the fatty light is contraindicated when, uh, when the patient is taking big therapy. It also binds to divalent cations in the GI tract. So similarly to dolutegravir, it's essentially dolutegravir, but in a co-formulated presentation as a single pill a day with uh, antracetamine and tenofovir. Uh, but because of this, then you have to make sure that you advise the patient not to take together with um, iron and calcium. It is very well tolerated. Most of my patients tell me it's like if they weren't taking anything. And it's taken as one tablet daily with or without food. The next agent we're going to talk about is ivalizumab. This is a, approved as an IV infusion that is, um, is infused every 14 days. And this is actually a monoclonal antibody. Um, it is a post-attachment inhibitor. I'll show in a second what this means. It says there's no tropism effect. What this means is so there's different types of HIV interact differently with the code receptors for the entry to the cell. And for example, if we recall the use of Maraviroc um, several years ago, you had to obtain this special blood test to make sure that the HIV that the patient um, was infected with was um, interacting with this code receptor. In this case, we don't need to because it interacts that the drug, um, the mechanism of action has no relationship with the code receptor. So we don't need to do the special blood test. It does not have any renal effect and no significant drug-drug interactions. So this is a mechanism of action of um, ibalizumab. So it's a monoclonal antibody that binds uh, to these um, the, the human um, histocompatibility complex uh, of a CD4 receptor after it has already, uh, it binds to the GP120. This is the envelope protein of the HIV. 
So once this monoclonal antibody binds there, then the, it can no longer do the conformational change and the virus cannot enter the cell. Uh, but keep in mind, this is only approved for heavily treatment exp experienced adults with multidrug resistant infection, failing current therapy. It does have some uh, side, uh, side effects that are listed of 5% of more to include diarrhea, dizziness, nausea, rash, uh, the potential of immune reconstitution syndrome, and pruritus. Um, and it does not interfere with the CD4 mediated immune function. So remember, I showed you guys um, that it binds to the CD4 uh, receptor, but it actually binds in an area that it does not interfere with the functionality of a CD4 cell. So um, that's important to keep in mind. Um, just to say, I although it's a great tool to have. I have not had the opportunity to use it. It's just because it's not very practical to bring the patients to the clinic every two weeks for IV infusions for the rest of their lives. But it's important to know that this is available um, in case you have patients with multidrug resistance. Doravirin is a newly approved non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. It was approved with uh, the, this presentation as pifeltro, um, uh, so doravirin to be mixed with other um, uh, antiretrovirals, or delstrigo, and delstrigo comes co-formulated with uh, tenofovir disoproxil and lamivudine, um, which is interesting. I think it's just the way that the trial was done. They only did it with tenofovir disoproxil. Um, this one could be potentially a tool for patients who have a lot of trouble with antiretroviral, with gaining weight uh, with antiretrovirals, just because we know that tenofovir disoproxil uh, tends to have a lower incidence of uh, weight gain compared to tenofovir alafenamide. Um, just another tool to have. It, it is approved for patients who are art naive or as switch therapy in patients with virologic suppression. And it has a unique resistance profile from other NNRTI. So even if you lose uh, your relativitin or a tri or your um, efavirenz, you may still be able to use uh, delstrigo or, or uh, doravirin. And your uh, resistance testing should be able to tell you that. There's uh, reported adverse effects. Uh, just not very common, nausea, headache, fatigue, diarrhea, abdominal pain, rash, which is known to happen with ON and RTIs. And then your neuropsychiatric side effects that are known to happen with your NNRTIs, such as abnormal dreams, insomnia, somnolence. However, these are less prevalent than your other NNRTIs, such as efavirenz or relativitin. It does not require renal adjustment, and it does not require adjustment of the dose with a mild to moderate hepatic disease. It has not been studied with severe hepatic disease. Um, it does have some drug interactions as any NNRTI, so it's not recommended to co-administer with strong inducers such as rifampin. Fostemsevir is another recent tool that was approved for a, the treatment of heavily, heavily treatment experienced adults with multidrug resistant HIV failing current therapy. The, it's actually a prodrug, so it needs to be metabolized to its active component called Temsevir, and it's an attachment inhibitor. It's an oral formulation. Um, and we see here how it, uh, the mechanism of action. So it binds near the binding site of the CD4 receptor um, in the GP120 envelope protein. Um, because it binds there, it prevents the binding of the CD4 with the GP120 envelope. So it um, ultimately leading to, uh, to hinder the passage of HIV or the entry of HIV into the host cell. And here we have it labeled as Temsavir because that's the actual active component. Side effects, similar to all the other antiretrovirals, nausea, diarrhea, headache, abdominal pain, um, GI issues, potentially rash, and um, immune reconstitution syndrome. It can actually raise the creatinine, which is something that um, it's particular to certain antiretrovirals, so keep that in mind. It can raise the liver function tests and direct bilirubin, and it can cause QT prolongation. 
And this is particularly important for patients who are uh, taking multiple medications or patients who are on antidepressants. So keep that in mind. I don't recall any other antiretroviral causing QT prolongation. We think about it very often when we're prescribing quinolones, but we don't really think about it as often when we're prescribing antiretrovirals. Um, it does not require adjustment with the renal impairment or hemodialysis or with hepatic impairment. Oh, the, the, the one thing just to say with Fostem Severe um, is that it, it has to be taken twice a day and it has to be taken with other um, antiretrovirals that are active for the patient's um, genotype. So it ends up being uh, multiple pills a day if when you're using Fostem Severe. Um, Lena Kapavir, kind of think about the similar similar utility. So it's also for heavily treatment experienced adult, adults with multi-drug resistance um, and failing current therapy. But it's actually an, a subcutaneous injection that is um, placed every six months. So think about the difference between taking multiple pills a day compared to getting a shot every six months. You still have to take it again with a uh, in, in combination with at least two or three active agents, according to the genotype. Uh, but it's, it's a really new, in, new mechanism of action, and it's actually a capsid inhibitor. I'll show how that works in the next slide. Um, it's been studied for PrEP. It's not yet approved for PrEP, but I think this would be a great uh, tool if it's ever able to be approved for PrEP. It does have some drug interactions, so that needs to be checked if you're going to be using this antiretroviral. So the capsid is this protein a package almost that encases your um, RNA and your proteins in the virus, and it participates in multiple different steps, steps of the viral replication. Uh, you see here that it um, participates in the nuclear transport of the virus, uh, then it disassembles, and that this assembly participates in the um, in the interaction of the integrase with a um, DNA chunk of your HIV, and um, it later also participates in multiple steps in the assembly and maturation. So, because of this lenacapavir, uh, it actually interferes with the structure of a capsid, and you can see that it ends up. Um, hindering the replication of the virus in multiple different steps. So it's a really cool, interesting mechanism of action. There are some significant uh, frequent reported side effects to include uh, swelling, pain, erythema nodules in the site of injection. And the nodules have been reported to be very last uh, uh, long, to last very long, up to three months or longer. So it's something to keep that in mind uh, if your patient um, uh, has significant concerns about these nodules. Um, it can also cause abnormal uh, elevated creatinine in liver enzymes and glucosuria. There's no adjustment for renal function or hepatic dysfunction. It has not been studied in severe hepatic dysfunction. Cabotegravir, so although there's tablets for cabotegravir, this is an integrase strand transfer inhibitor. Um, I think we all know cabotegravir to be um, a tool that is more frequently known as an injectable. So it was the first uh, injectable long-acting uh, antiretroviral that was approved for both um, a treatment and it's also approved for prevention for PrEP. The brand name for treatment is Cabenuva, and it comes uh, uh, co-formulated with Repivirin, uh, which is an NNRTI. And uh, for uh, prevention, it is approved as um, Apritude. And these are approved for, for treatment is for switch therapy in patients with virologic suppression, so similar to uh, what used to be Juluca, what, what it is Juluca, which is your combination of dolutegravir and, and relpivirin, but imagine a long, uh, an injection, long-acting Juluca almost. Um, so it's a, it ends up being your dual therapy integrase inhibitor and an NRTI. 
It is contraindicated with some uh, medications, so always double check your drug interactions. For repivoting, so we always think about the issues with um, absorption, GI absorption in patients who are taking PPIs. However, in this case, you're bypassing the GI absorption, so you don't have to think about that. Um, but you do have some other interactions, so always double check drug interactions. Um, these are just a bunch of numbers <laughs> to remind you guys that there's a complex dosing. Um, it ends up being, once you have done the loading, it ends up being two shots every two months um, for treatment and the one shot every two months for prevention if you're using cabotegravir for prevention. There is an optional leading of it's, I think, up to the provider and the patient to decide. The majority of the people I know who are, who are able to implement Cabenuga in their practice are doing it without the oral leading, but this is definitely an option if the patient prefers. And there's a bit of a wiggle room if you're not able, if a patient is not able to go to the clinic for the shots within uh, five days before or after the date that they were scheduled to receive the monthly injection. So if that doesn't happen, then they may need to bridge with the oral formulation. There are some reported post-injection reactions to include dyspnea, agitation, abdominal cramping, flushing, sweating, oral numbness. Um, it actually, so I was expecting, yes, there's, there's very frequent reports of um, side uh, reactions or of injection site reactions, but it's not as severe as I was expecting initially, considering that it is a deep intramuscular shot. So pain discomfort, but what I hear from patients is that it's not even as painful as a penicillin shot. Um, so in duration, swelling, all of this is expected with any intramuscular shot. Uh, reported, uh, reported other uh, adverse effects include parexia, fatigue, headache, myalgia, nausea, sleep disorders, um, dizziness. So some of this is also related to the neuropsychiatric side effects of um, cruel pivoting, so keep that in mind, um, especially if your patient has history of neuropsychiatric disorders in the past. And it can also increase the CPK. So other two drug regimens that are, were recently approved include dolutegravir and lamivudine, brand name is Dovato. Keep in mind that this is not your best tool to use for rapid start because you need to make sure that your patient has a viral load less than 500,000. You cannot use it in patients with HPV co-infection because it does not have a good action against um, hepatitis B. And it does not, it is not recommended if you're going to start it prior to knowing your genotype, but you can use it in treatment naive patients if you have all of this information. So you just wouldn't be able to do a rapid start. Um, it is also approved for virologically suppressed patients as a switch therapy. So in summary, we have a lot of new tools. We talked about a new one in RTI called Doravarin, a new post-attachment inhibitor called Ivalizumab, a new attachment inhibitor called Fostemsevir, a capsid inhibitor called Lenacapavir, and a new IM formulation dual therapy, Cabotegravir and Rolpivirin. And uh, this just opens the... Um, discussion for a paradigm shift. After 20 plus years of three drug therapy, um, a dual therapy regimens are gaining traction for both switch and therapy initiation. And I think we're seeing this a lot more often. So it's great to have these new tools in, in our um, toolbox. These are our resources and we 